we're going to look at six Proverbs. And the first one is from 1216. It says, a fool's displeasure is known at once, but whoever ignores an insult is sensible. A fool's displeasure is known at once, but whoever ignores an insult is sensible. So, I mean, this one is one of those ones that, that, that makes sense, but it's just one that we don't really apply too much, um, especially in the heat of the moment. Uh, if you are married or have kids or an annoying job, I mean, right off the bat, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Or, you know, maybe you have a tense family situation. This is one of those proverbs that really goes and says a lot. But once again, we don't really just apply it a whole lot. Um, it, it's very foolish to let your displeasure be known. So th there's this thinking nowadays that, you know, when you kind of lose your temper and kind of let people uh, know, know what's inside, it, it, it somehow empowers you. It helps you to prove your point that, uh, you know, you're standing up for yourself, you know. But that's actually not, not so much. It just kind of makes you look foolish and uh, kind of puts up more barriers to progress, you know, in the situation. Um, I mean, think about family get-togethers that you might have. And think about that person who always seems to say that thing that just sets you off. I mean, whoever it is, you know who it is. You know, you go to a family get-together and there's always that one person. And, uh, you know, they say these things, they just are kind of things to get, maybe they're just trying to rile you up. Is that possible? <laughs> and uh, whatever, work, it works. And so then what we do is we match their stupid, right? We instantly, our, our face changes, our breathing changes, our, our grip on our, on our hands changes. A fool's displeasure is known at once, but whoever ignores an insult is sensible. Um, I, I remember numerous times when... Um, I was thinking, you know, somebody said something, and I, and I remember thinking, I have to stand up for myself. You know, so I put my foot down, and I stood up for myself. And then, you know, after, you know, just kind of feeling stupid, you know. It, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things where it doesn't ever work out the good way. Um, you have to be okay with them just doing whatever they're going to do, and then you just kind of do the right thing, and whatever they're going to do is whatever they're going to do. Um, I remember... Uh, there was this one time I was, uh, we were driving across, uh, man, I don't even know where it was. We were driving across country somewhere. Uh, we were packed in this SUV, though, that only had a front seat and middle seat. Like, the back seat was all, like, storage stuff. So there were, like, five seating. The middle seat wasn't, like, one of those luxurious SUVs. It was, like, one of those narrow <laughs> models where it's almost like they just took a um, sedan and made it a little taller. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, uh, my, my sister has this, has this wonderful gift of um, sarcasm and uh, talking a lot. And, you know, not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but when you're the youngest, it, it kind of, obviously. So she's going and going and going. And it's probably been, at this point, it was probably about, Mm, I want to say it was about an hour and a half she'd been going. So it was uh, probably somewhere, you know, when you turn on, like, post, and you're headed not quite to, like, um, let's see, there's, like, that one Texas city that starts with an M. I forget what it is. And then you get before you get to Abilene, you know, you got post, and you go down, and you hit those other ones, and then you get to Abilene. What? No, it's not Mesquite. No. Um, oh, I'm not going to remember. Uh, and then before you get to Abilene, and she did it from right around that area all the way to the other side. Snyder. I'm sorry, it's not M, it's Snyder. That's what it is, not an M. So, you know, you go post and you go Snyder and you go through there and you get to Abilene. So it was probably somewhere around the post area all the way through until we got to close to Abilene. And, uh, yeah, it was right before Abilene. And, man, she was just going and going and going. And so I saw an opportunity to say one snide comment to break the attack just because I was so frustrated with it. And I took it, and for 0.5 milliseconds, it was glorious. Instantly, she shut up. Then she starts crying. Then my dad gets mad. And uh, I realized, not because of my dad or my sister, I realized I didn't want to be that kind of a person. And it, it, it was too late then because I already made that choice. And once you start learning to open your mouth widely, it's very hard to learn how to shut it again. So a fool's displeasure is known at once. Um, and this doesn't just apply to that. When you're dealing with your kids, you know, be patient. Don't overreact. Um, at your job, at your church, in a ministry, whatever it is that we're talking about. 
Um, don't walk around with a chip on your shoulder. Listen and close your mouth. Here's the thing, because you're going to misunderstand some situations, and they're going to misunderstand some situations. So you have to be a master of not every single time that you get mad is it excuse and reason to just kind of go crazy. Uh, 1227, a lazy hunter doesn't roast his game, but to a diligent person, his wealth is precious. Now, this is one of those Proverbs that is a um, really a principle of life that he's applying to one specific situation to help you see the principle. So I'll give you some modern day examples. When you buy groceries and you let them go bad while you eat out every day. You know what I mean? Have you ever done that? You go shopping and then the, the, the food that you bought goes bad because you're eating out, right? Um, that would be a good example of a lazy hunter doesn't roast his game, but to a diligent person, his wealth is precious. You buy the, buy the stuff, but then you're just too tired to cook it. So you eat out. And then your stuff goes bad. I mean, it's, you, you caught the game. You're just not. You, you're not roasting the game. <laughs> um, another example: um, when you leave your ref leftovers to, to rot rather than refrigerate than reheat. You made the food. It's there. You stick it in the fridge, and it dies in the Tupperware container. I mean, maybe three weeks later, you remember it's there, and you're like, "Oh, what have I done?" <laughs> and the smell when you open it. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a new level right there. Um, get, you you go, to the, go to the trouble of getting a job, but you don't show up. You get married, but you don't really contribute to the marriage. Um, you get an inheritance, but you spend it in a day. I mean, it, it's, it's an example there. It's the idea of overlooking a blessing. You're, you're mismanaging what you have. Um, I mean, think of how many times those of, those of us who are in good health, and uh, we live each day as though it's just another day. You know, we're in perfectly good health, but we cease to take the day because it's just another day. That would be a good example. You know, every, every moment is a blessing, but we just mismanage it. Um, and a, a few more examples here. When you start something, but you never finish it. Uh, you know, your meat goes bad. Money is wasted. Relationship deterior relationships in your life deteriorate. Um, and there's always excuses for why you, you didn't take care of the thing. Well, I'll take care of it later. I'll do it when I have more time. I'll, I'll do it when, you know... When this happens, when this, and then it, there's always another excuse. The Proverbs puts it like this. It says that um, the, the lazy person says, there's a lion outside. <laughs> there's always another excuse. Like There's always something else that stops you from doing it. And uh, this is one of those ones that I, I think, um, when I first read it as a kid, I didn't really get it. And then I went to college, and my roommate used to do this thing where he would reheat his coffee in, in the microwave. <laughs> But he wouldn't go and get it. He wouldn't get up to get it, and he'd say, "Oh, I wish I had coffee." And he's like, "Well, it's in the microwave." So then he'd get up again and microwave it. And so all night I'd get to hear the microwave going off, beep, beep, beep. And then if you didn't push the button, it would do that thing, you know, beep. Every like I don't know, minute or something like that, beep. I'm trying to sleep because I sleep, and <laughs> that's what I do. Uh, maybe maybe other people don't like doing that, but but that's one of my things. It's kind of like my jam. I sleep. Um, some people are really good at sports, or you know. Yeah, you know, whatever. I'm really good at sleeping. It's one of those things. I, I, it, it takes very little effort. I do it on my back. It's awesome, you know. But, uh, you know, hearing those constant beeps. So what I would start doing is I would, I would start just, if you barely push the open button, just barely, it would stop beeping. But the door stays closed. Coffee's still warm, theoretically. Everything's fine. Well, so then he was like, well, I don't hear the beeping, so I forget that it's in there. And then I said, wait, no, 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 hold on. You, you realized it was in there when you let it beep all night? <laughs> Anyways, a good example of a lazy hunter doesn't roast his game. I mean, a really, really good example. Uh, Proverbs 13.1, a wise son responds to his father's discipline, but a mocker doesn't listen to rebuke. Now, there's a lot of people who have different kinds of relationships with their fathers, not always so great. Uh, some people have excellent relationships with their fathers. Either way, I think that the principle here still applies. When someone corrects us, we do a few different things. First off, we, we retaliate, right? The gloves go on. <laughs> uh, the second thing that we do is we stiff our neck. I mean, think of those times that your spouse tells you, you know, there's a better way of doing that, and now you got to do it the wrong way just to prove your point, right? You're like, well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so we stiffen our neck. I mean, if you've ever been a teenager, you do the exact same thing. I know what I'm doing, Dad. And then you're like, ta, ta. so then you have to make it look like you know what you're doing. I remember there was this one time uh, back when I worked construction, and I was so tired. He, we were working 10 to 12 hour shifts every single day, starting at five or six in the morning. I was so tired, and so I sat down to pick up this trash. But it looked like 
I sat down to pick up a box so I could put all the trash in the box. And right at that time, my dad, who's also my boss, says, smart thinking to get in a box to put all the trash in so you don't have to keep getting up. And I was like, yeah, that's what I was doing. Yep, that's me, smart guy that I am. Uh, but so we retaliate, we stiff our necks, um, or we tell them what's up, you know. Oh, let me tell you. You think the do 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 is actually your fault, and you know, we, we, tell, them what, we tell them what's up. Uh, and so a foolish person just goes their own way. You know, they, they follow their own path. They don't listen to advice. They don't ask for advice. They just kind of, they, they've got it all figured out. And uh, I, I think the perfect example of a prideful, arrogant, foolish person is a teenager. Now, hold on, hold on. We've all been there. You think you know everything. Typical of an arrogant, prideful, foolish person. They think they know everything. Somebody tells you something and you instantly take it the wrong way and you have to prove your point and stiffen your neck. Have, haven't we all been teenagers? I mean, that's a perfect example. So I think I want to follow that up with this. Stop every once in a while and say, am I acting like a teenager? And then if you are, well, then stop. There you go. There's a couple seconds of wisdom there. Uh, you know, and another thing that we do, which is really toxic, this is extremely toxic. When everybody talks about toxic nowadays, they're toxic. This relationship is toxic. Let me tell you something that's really toxic. When somebody corrects us and we say something along the lines of this, that's just who I am and you have to deal with it. So rather than growing and learning, that's just who I am and you have to deal Well, hold on now. <laughs> Are they right? And do you need to grow? I mean, you don't want to keep yourself in that stagnant place for the rest of your life, do you? Like, you want to reach a point in saying, hey, maybe I don't have it all figured out. Maybe I do need a couple of ideas here. Um, <clears throat> uh, we get mad. We get even. You have to say it just right for us to listen. Here's the thing about wisdom, okay? Now, this took me a long time to realize it. Wisdom is not natural. Wisdom is not a natural way of thinking. It's not. Foolishness is the natural way of thinking. It is. It comes natural. We are all born with it. It takes hard work and dedication to be, become wise. You have to start listening to other people. You have to start asking other people's advice. You have to stop and slow down and ask yourself, why am I really doing this? And that doesn't really come natural. We make up our minds and we just stick with it. We choose what we want to believe, and that's just the way it is. And that's wrong. Wisdom is not a natural process to us. And so we have to prove ourselves. I know what I'm doing. It's okay if you don't know what you're doing, though. I mean, think about how many times you become a parent, right? I, I got it covered. I know what I'm doing. Okay. All right. When you start a new job, you, you want to prove to somebody that you can do it. Remember when your dad or mom first gave you that big responsibility? Maybe it was a pet. Maybe it was a job. Maybe it was whatever. Uh, you were going to spend the first night out at a friend's, night, how, friend's house or something like that. And, you know, they were trusting you. And uh, you, you came up with that exact same thing. You know, I, I got to prove myself. And, and, you know, I don't need anybody's advice. I'm just going to figure it out on my own. And when I figure it out on my own, then I'll show them. Remember? Remember what it was like to be a kid? Kind of the exact same thing. Um, so, 1320, the one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. This is one of those things that really applies if you're a leader, but it also applies in many different ways for all of us. So let me just kind of go down the list of ways I found it applies to my life. My life. Number one, watch your company. Watch the company that you keep. So many times we put ourselves and surround ourselves with just people who are no good for us. I mean, really, there's got to be a line where we say, hey, you know, this is not a good idea. If you want to succeed, be around people who succeed. Are you trying to get your finances under control? Get around people who are financially wise. I didn't say get around people who look, look rich. No, no, no. If people are spending a bunch of money buying the newest cars and the newest fashion, the newest houses, I can guarantee you that they're either not rich or they're not going to be rich for long. They're living in debt. Smart people, rich, smart people aren't throwing money away every five seconds. They don't buy timeshares. They don't you know, uh, they don't have a maxed out credit card. They don't have a brand new car every month. They don't, they, don't, they don't do that stuff. That's something that poor people do to appear rich. They want to seem rich. So they do stuff like buy things on credit card to make themselves feel better. It, 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 it's a competition is all it is. So if you let your jealousy rise, you're going to copy that behavior. But if you let wisdom rule, then you're going to find yourself surrounded by people who are succeeding in those areas. 
Um, you want to be someone who's not, who, who doesn't lose their temper as much, who, who uh, is better with their kids, who um, works hard. Be around other people who do those things. You know, um, I, there's a lot of times when we're talking to people who are getting out of drugs and they say something along the lines of this. It's not a sin for me to hang out with those people. I need to share the gospel with them too. You're right. They do need to hear the gospel, and it's not a sin for you to hang out with them. However, these are the same people who you used to go drinking and drugging with, and that's kind of just a bad idea. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not a sin. You're right, but it is a little bit foolish. A little bit foolish. What are the chances? Of, exactly. This is exactly why I don't drink in my household. I, I believe Christians can drink. Okay, I'm just throwing that out there right there. My father was an alcoholic. His father was an alcoholic. His father was an alcoholic. And I don't want to be an alcoholic. I can't now anyways because of this. <laughs> I, I, they actually told me big no on alcohol or caffeine. And I'm like, both? <laughs> so anyways, uh, and then I don't want my kids to, you know, get, get stuck in that kind of stuff. You know, and so I'm doing it, for example, for my family to stand my ground and, you know, show them there is another way. But also because we deal with a lot of alcoholics. I don't do it so I can get on my high horse and say true Christians don't drink alcohol ever. I mean, I mean, you really, it's it would be foolish for me to drink alcohol is what it comes down to. So you know, you have to find where where you fit on that, and that's totally fine because I know that the Holy Spirit works in you the same as He works in me. So I have to kind of just be okay with that. So um, some good examples of of how this applies to leadership when you're a pastor. There's a lot of pastors I know who just sit in their office and think that they know everything. They know how to counsel everybody. They know, they know how to write a good sermon. They got to figure it out. Then there's people like me who realize how much we don't realize. <laughs> and so we get mentors, people who teach us and train us. And no matter how old we get, we need a mentor. Uh, we read books, get other people's inputs. Uh, we take classes. I actually just finished a leadership program called uh, Sam Chan's Leadership Institute. An excellent class. If you're ever going to be in a leadership position, I suggest it. And uh, it, took, it was a 12-month course. And uh, it's just, just stuff for leaders for 12 months. Just finished it. And uh, so these are the kinds of things. If you're a musician, you get lessons. Go take lessons. Uh, if you want to do and get better in finances and parenting and leadership, get help. There's this idea that I have to have it all figured out. No, no, no. The one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. So you inevitably become like those you associate with. It's just a fact of life. I've met so many Christians, so many Christians who say something along the lines of this. I'm witnessing to them, or my all-time favorite, I'm counseling them, I'm guiding them. But what they don't realize is they're getting corrupted. They're hanging around those people to guide and, and counsel them. But what actually is happening is they're listening to gossip, they're believing the gossip, they're taking on the bad attitude, and then they're repeating the gossip. That is what I've seen time and time again. And I've never actually seen that model of, I'm counseling them, I just... This is the way that their heart's going to be changed. No, I've never seen it happen. Never seen that happen. If people need counseling, they go to counseling. They don't go to someone who they can talk bad about this other person. They don't do that. Oh, me, I'm just here to, here to counsel Victoria while she's talking bad about Lorianne the whole time. No. No. And what you really got to watch out for is when you already have a bad attitude for that person. Let's say I hate Lorianne. And now Victoria comes up and says, oh, I'm so heartbroken. She's in tears. I'm like, oh, I'll be your friend. I'll listen. I'll be here for you. Best. You guys, ever, you guys remember Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory? Best friends. <laughs> anyways, anyways. Um, so when someone is, is off, either spiritually speaking, and like, as, like, as a Christian or, or like emotionally speaking, it will affect you. It's going to drain you. It's going to influence you. You know how many times people I've seen where like they have, let's say they have depression, and then they get in a relationship with someone who also has depression. We're going to carry each other. No, you're not. It's going to be a train wreck. It's going to go terribly. You're either both going to be die, die. One of you is going to die. The relationship is going to end. You're going to be in, in some kind of a psych ward within the year. You can't do this. It's just not smart. But anyways, it's one of those things where, where you know, we, we always think that we have it figured out, and, and we don't which is why it's so important. The one who walks with the wise will become wise. Don't surround yourselves with a bunch of turkeys and expect to fly like an eagle, you know. So Proverbs 15, 2 says, The tongue of the wise makes knowledge attractive, but the mouth of fools blurts out foolishness. Uh, you could say this another way. A foolish person just says the first thing that comes to their head. First thing. But a wise person thinks about how can I make this, how can I make what I'm about to say 
easier for them to understand and to accept. You know what I mean? Not just understand, but also accept. Think about how many times you talk to your kids, for instance, and think about if you were actually trying to teach them something that you wanted them to remember. You'd keep it short, you'd say it nice, and in a nice way, right? So uh, when you witness, here's a great example that I've seen all growing up. People go to witness and tell people how it is and tell them about the Lord and stuff, and it actually just comes down to them you know, yelling and arguing with them. And it's like, oh, okay. I call it the Lee Strobel effect because there's this, there's this um, Christian apologist. His name's Lee Strobel. He wrote uh, The Case for Christ and all this, okay? What people do is they read a book like that, and then they, they use it as, as ammo, ammunition, so that they can barrage somebody, as some unsuspecting person on the YouTube comments or wherever else, you know, uh, with a constant assault of, I've got the perfect articulated uh, uh, argument to, that will win them over. First off, Paul actually tells us not to do that. That's the first thing. Second off, um, when you do that, people take it as an attack, and they'll just dig their heels in just to prove a point. And um, then the third, third point is, even if you said the right things perfectly, you cannot change a heart by your words alone. You understand that? You cannot say the perfect things in the perfect way, and someone changed. It is only by the Holy Spirit that that happens. It's not something you can force. It's not something that you can... Uh, you know, argue, this isn't like a, a, a this isn't, you, you aren't a, what's it called, an attorney in the courtroom. Like, that's not what's happening. And uh, just because you talk loud and, and long doesn't mean anything. Most of the time, if you really want to win people over, the best ways to do it is by listening to what they have to say and then loving them through service. Those are typically the best ways to, uh, and, and here's the thing, when you, when you friend somebody, do it to be their friend, not so that you can say something to them. You know what I mean? I have an ulterior motive. He, 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 he. I'm going to tell them about Jesus when they're least expecting it. <laughs> I mean, obviously you don't have to like hide and be ashamed of the gospel. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But the tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable. And it, it, it thinks about how to say something. You know what I mean? There's a right way and a wrong way. So you see somebody messing up, and you know, hey, you're wrong. You need to get your crap together. Well, yeah, you could say that, but they'll probably just make them mad. Like there, there's a way to say it and a way not to say it. Um, so you're witnessing tactfully at the right time. Well, when you talk to your kids, there's another great example. A lot of times we, t we cough out because we, we are tired, so tired, of the arguments and of the, um, you know, teaching them stuff every five seconds. So, they look at just, uh. so what we do is we have a little cough out. So we do like, so because I told you so, right? This is one of, one of my favorites when I'm really tired. <laughs> I told you so, now go do it. <laughs> Anyways, and here's the thing. It, it, that doesn't really work to help kids learn. Instead, you have to be patient and actually communicate things. And that's hard. It's hard to communicate. Um, once you learn how to do it, it's okay. But a lot of times we say, oh, I communicated. Here's, here's a good example. If any of you guys have ever been in a leadership position, you ask for something to get done, get done and, and it doesn't get done, you're like, what happened? We had this meeting. Everybody knew it was supposed to get done because there wasn't clarity. Of course there was. I told them to do it. No, no, no. Tell them who does what by when. Clarity. You're communicating. You. I want you tomorrow morning to go talk to the police officer and tell them this. Who does what by when. It's very clear. You have communicated effectively. But a lot of times we tell our kids things we're not really communicating. We're just kind of shouting or telling, not communicating. There's a huge difference. And it's one of those things that I struggle with all the time. i finally gotten a real good handle on it in like... Um, the, the job that I do here. And that's pretty much the only arena of my life that I do it well at. I'm trying. I've started incorporating in my marriage, and that's gone very well. Now, trying to incorporate with my kids is a lot harder because the interruptions and the questions and that. God, that's, did, are you sure you're all ours? Maybe you need to go to the neighbor's house. Okay, that's your home now. Anyways, um, you know, obviously, and here's the thing. This has limits, especially when you're talking to, for instance, your kids, because... Sometimes your kids will just take advantage of it and manipulate you, and they'll kind of walk on you, and they'll start asking about everything. And so there has to be a line. But still, you, you, you try to avoid the cop-outs and actually uh, try to t teach your kids something with wisdom. So there, there was a movie I saw, Star Wars Episode Eight. Oh, I, I stopped with Star Wars. It's just too much. They've got the shows and the movies. and the, I remember back in the good old days, back when it was just Episodes 4, 5, and 6. That was all we needed. 
Okay, I didn't need, need to know about sand or any of the other things that happened later on. None of it. I, we didn't need any of that. Okay, all we needed was episodes four, five, and six. Anyways, well, in, in episode eight, there's this part, and it's very aggravating, where this new commander takes over the fleet for the rebels. You, you don't really need to know the details. There's these two armies, the rebels and the empire. Okay, just that's simple enough. Well, the, the rebels are fleeing. They're running away from the, from the empire. And they have a change in, in leadership, and the new commander takes over. And she keeps doing this thing where she doesn't explain any of her actions, and she leaves her soldiers in the dark through the whole movie. They have no direction, no clarity. She's just making whatever decisions she feels like making and not communi communicating anything. So obviously, one of her, one of her underlings, one of her you know, soldiers, uh, and gets an idea of how to, you know, oust her and get the fleet to safety where everybody's saved. And uh, then it turns out that she had this, this thing, this plan that she was doing the whole time, but she didn't communicate it. And, you know, that's bad leadership 101. Imagine if a pastor did that. We're supposed to be known by transparency. Imagine, imagine if a husband did that, and the wife is like, what's going on? And the husband's just like, you just have to trust me. I don't communicate. You know, it's like, uh, but <laughs> that wouldn't work. I, I believe for most of us that wouldn't work. I know, right? If my if my wife did that, I'd be a little upset. I'd be like, uh, no, 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 no. This is something we need to talk about. Well, what's going on? And uh, so when talking, talk in a wise way, not snide, not cynical, always saying something, you know, underhanded, not, not talking frustrated all the time. Make it easy for people to accept, for people to understand. There's sometimes I'm talking about something in the Bible that's from the Old Testament, which I know people typically don't read the Old Testament. So I try to say it in ways that they'll get. I'm not trying to talk to them like they're stupid. I'm trying to talk to them where if you have no knowledge of the Old Testament, you'll be okay. You'll be all right. You aren't going to be lost for the entire sermon just because you don't get this. So I, I try to do that. I try to make it easy to understand. And then I try to say it in a way where it's easy to accept. You know what I mean? Like, I know a lot of people who, um, they just have this... This one pastor I knew up north, he had this, oh, this look on his face whenever he said something. Just, are you trying to irritate people, buddy? <laughs> Get the look off your face if you're trying to, if you want people to listen to what you have to say. I mean, you really communicate a lot here. Um, so make it easy for people to accept. It doesn't matter if we're talking about your employees, your children, or non-Christians. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable. Think about what you're saying. Think about what you should be saying, because sometimes we don't need to be talking at all. <laughs> And this is the last proverb we're looking at tonight. Proverbs 15.10. Discipline is harsh for the one who leads the path. The one who hates correction will die. I had a friend back in the day. And they left the faith. And uh, when she did, she went back to her old lifestyle that she used to live in before she got saved. Now, this was, she was saved for like, ooh, I want to say 15 or 18 years. Something like that. And she went back, and she went back. And when she, when she left the face, she went back to all of her old lifestyle. And things ended up not going very well for her. Um, she ended up having just problem after problem that came up. And uh, God is oftentimes uh, harsher. God is oftentimes harsher on those who know and then rebel versus those who don't know. You know what I mean? Um, what's a way I could say that? Um, it's like if your kid does something that you've told them like 12 or 15 times not to do versus a kid comes over and stays at your house and he does it one time, right? It's a little bit different, isn't it? Um, yeah, right, right. It's, this isn't something that we've been over 100 times here, buddy. You know what I mean? It's like you, when your son does something, you're like, buddy, we've been over this. Well, you know what's going on. We're having the same. My favorite thing is when I say, buddy, haven't I told you not to do that? And this is my all-time favorite answer. No. Where were you for the past four days? I said this literally like 50 times. Uh, anyways, this is why my hair is disappearing, guys. This is, this is the, it used to be down here, if you can believe it. Back when I was younger, in the good old days. <laughs> I was shaving the other day. Or trimming, I guess. I was trimming the other day, and all this gray and white stuff's coming. I'm like, ah, 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 it's my dad's hair coming off my face. And I realized it's my hair. And I even held it up. I was like, are you sure? Are we sure? And my wife does my head, and I'm all picking up. I'm like, oh, youth, where are you? <laughs> Anyways. Um, and 
<laughs> and when you when you when you give when you, when you give up on something, it changes you. When you give up in life, it changes you. There's something that happens when you choose to persevere versus when you learn to give up about stuff. I, I can't explain exactly what happens, but it just it just changes you. Uh, I'm sure if you guys think back to when you were teenagers, you, you'll you'll think of things. You know what I mean? When you when you're a teenager, you either learn how to rise above things and it, it forms you for the rest of your life, or you learn how to give up on stuff and and that forms you for the rest of your life. I can't do it. If I try, I'm just going to fail. Try that before. And so our life becomes a repeating cycle of that. See what I mean? You can usually tell people who have done real good in sports as teenagers, especially when they had real stiff competition, because they have this, this idea in them that, you know, let's just keep going. You know? And, and then you can tell the people who were lonely guitar players who practiced for 15 hours a day because they didn't have any friends. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I, I kid. I joke. But um, so, you know, a good example of this would be um, I, I had this, this, this woman who I knew. She, we were real good friends. And she kind of developed this attitude that I'm just better than my husband. So this was not, not me. It wasn't my wife. It was a woman I knew, her husband. Okay, so sorry. I know that might have been a little bit confusing just then. Uh, anyways, remember the part where I said that, you know, you try to make wisdom in an understandable way? Yeah, I'm not doing that. Uh, <laughs> so her husband, she had this idea that she was just better than him. And uh, so she got this idea, okay, so I'm better than him. So then over time, she got this idea. I deserve to cheat with someone who, you know, really loves me for who I am, who's actually going to be there for me. Um, and so she did. But the problem was that as soon as she cheated, she was at the same level as her husband. Something changed. See what I mean? Before, she had the upper hand because she was doing the right thing. But then she stooped down and got on his level. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, she didn't have the upper hand anymore. And it was one of those things that happened so quickly, she didn't even understand how drastically her attitude had changed and the situation had changed. Who knew that a one-night stand could have such a huge effect on your character? And it does. People always have this idea, I'm going to cheat on my spouse, and nobody's going to know. Oh, everybody will know. Everybody will know. It'll be so plain from the look on your face from your characteristic, from the nasty little attitude that will be lurking behind everything that you say. It's evident. Everybody knows. <laughs> You're not fooling anyone. And uh, it's best to just come clean and own up to your spouse as, as the best course of action. Because here's the thing. They're going to find out eventually. It's something I found out with cheating and with lying. I've never cheated on my wife. But, well, I have cheated on her with porn. We've all had those dark moments in our marriage. That was one of the dark moments in my marriage. Um, I used to be massively addicted to pornography, and I figured I'm going to get married, and that's going to solve my problem. Well, it didn't solve my problem. I was just a married porn addict. <laughs> so it didn't really work. So obviously, you know, there was that. But, I mean, uh, cheating physically, I, I've never done that. But it's one of those things that, yep, you're going to get found out. Yep. I've been in ministry for 17 years, and I can say absolutely yes. You'll get found out. It, it, it's going to happen. It, it's going to happen. If you think about it, don't. Just move on. Proverbs actually has this proverb that is, yes, I couldn't have said it better. He says, why should you not be satisfied with your wife? Well, she's hotter. So turn off the lights when you're with your wife. I mean, goodness sakes, if that's the only thing that's keeping you, there should be more to sex than just she's hotter. Especially, that's something boys do. Like, when you're a man, you should be moved past that by now. You know what I mean? Like, there's a point when you should be, become a man. Like, you're in a large boy's body. You should at least think like a man. <laughs> you know, anyways. And uh, anyways, that kind of foolishness is really for kids. I mean, you, when you get older, you just really shouldn't. Anyways, um, so when you hate learning, when you hate changing, when you hate growing, you set yourself up for failure. Well, I'm tired of struggling with this. I'm, I'm tired of struggling with this. Okay, but you still got to deal with it because if you give up, it's going to change you. You need the growth. You need, no, no, I don't need the growth. Yes, you do need the growth. We all need to be growing. We need to be in a constant state of growth. Um, situations get harder when you give up, when you go back to it because you have to start over. When you're dealing with panic attacks and you stop because yeah, it's fine. I've done really good. It, you don't just stay like this. You go like this. Yeah. Um, it's not just panic attacks. Uh, drugs. 
you're doing drugs, you're doing well, you're not on drugs. I, I, I can take a hit and it's not really going to affect me. Nope, right back to it. That quick. That quick. They, say, they have the statement that they use, and I totally fully endorse it. Once an addict, always an addict. Never think, oh, because I've been off of drugs for X amount of time, I can try it again and it won't affect me. I can be around it again. No, 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 no. I'm not going to be home alone with internet access. I know who I am. I know what's in my heart. Don't fool yourself into believing that you're a perfectly good citizen in your heart. You never do anything wrong. Don't, don't kid yourself. Be honest with yourself. You can kid all those other people. Be honest with yourself. We all have our dark sides. Be wise. Figure it out and figure out how to get over it. Um, pornography is another great example. You know, oh, I've been doing real good. You know, so I'll just one thing. You know, like it's like cheat days with with the diet. It doesn't work, guys. It first off, if you're trying to do a diet, don't do cheat days. It doesn't actually. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't. But we're talking about things that are much more important than cheat days. We're talking about pornography and drugs and all, cheating and big things, guys, big things. Um, uh, there was a... So if someone goes to church and causes a problem at the church, a church split or something like that, okay, it, they're going to have a harder time coming back Especially coming back and then getting back involved with stuff. Okay, like let me give you, let's not dwell in the realm of hypothetical. I cheat on my wife. We have a big messy divorce. I leave the church. It's going to be harder for me to come back to the church and get involved again than it would have been if I was a really, really bad off person that was not a Christian that got saved and came into the church. The, the pastor would trust me sooner and give me a position sooner. The people would trust me sooner. But once you're established a Christian leader in the church, you know, that kind of stuff, it's different, right? And that's kind of what we're talking about here. Discipline is harsh for the one who leads the path. It's harsh. Um, as Christians, God is constantly refining us. He's constantly disciplining us. What we think is we think of discipline as a spanking, right? So I messed up, and God's going to give me a spanking. That's how we think about it. But God's discipline is more like his process of growing you, and it's not because you did something bad, it's because you're alive. God is disciplining you, and sometimes these are very painful things. Death of a loved one, difficult situation at work, financial struggles, uh, having a disease. I mean, any kind of thing that you can imagine. These are God's little ways of disciplining us. Remember when you were a kid, and your mom and your dad got on your nerves? Think of that as God's hammer and chisel that's chipping away at pieces of you and making you into a diamond. That's his process. When you're a teenager, he uses, he uses the parents to irritate those things out of you. Unfortunately, we stiffen our necks, and then we learn to deal with it as 20 and 30 and 40-year-olds until finally we either get over it, and then we get on back on good terms with our parents, or we die bitter and nasty. I mean, it's one of those things where either way, you choose whatever you want, but God's going to keep disciplining. And uh, the very last thing in the end of the Old Testament that, 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 that is said in the Old Testament before Jesus comes in the New Testament, the very last thing that it says, he wants to reconcile the sons to the fathers, and if they don't, then wrath is going to come on them. That's the very last thing that's said in the Old Testament. And end of the book of Malachi. The idea here is that God wants to define, uh, uh, refine us and discipline us and grow our character and, and, and heal our relationships with others. So uh, that's really all I got. Uh, discipline is harsh for the one who leaves the path. Now, this end tab here is a joke. Because I read a lot of fantasy, and fantasy always does this kind of crap. The end of book seven, part four, chapter eight. It's like, okay, I get it. This is a really long fantasy. I should have looked it up before I started, and I'm sorry. Uh, I, I just finished this, this, this fantasy series called Will of Time um, last week or the week before. And it's 14 books long, guys. And these aren't just like 200-page books. I mean, these are massive. these are massive books. Yeah, she's only on book five, and she's been going for months. It took me three years, three years to finish this fantasy series. So I thought since we've been in Proverbs for so long, I had to make a good joke about fantasy books. So I did. There's your joke. 